Hi everyone. We'll see we see a few people trickling in. Welcome, welcome. Good morning to today's uh, session, making your case for inclusive design. Um, I'm Vicky. I'll be your host for today. Along with me, there's Gabby, there's Vilya, and there's Tasha. So if there's anything that you need, you can reach out to them in the Zoom chat and you can um, let them know what your trouble is. Cool. Awesome. We see a few people. Um, kind of want to do a shout out where you guys are from. So maybe in the chat, if you can let me know where you're from, which city you're from as well, or with an emoji flag, that would be super. Um, wanted to know where all you guys are from. Um, to give a bit of introduction while you're doing that, um, I'm Vicky. I'm the product manager and product strategist at a design agency called 62. And we have been running um, Project Lima for quite some time now, over a year. Um, and it's been a pleasure for me to work together with such a great team that could, you know, really um, think outside the box and really solve these problems in, in, uh, in a very innovative way. And, and this time we're actually tackling the topic of inclusive design. Um, and I'm really interested in it. Uh, I've been talking to a few people who are uh, who are in the accessibility realm um, and I'm really intrigued and that's why we're so excited that we can bring a few of our guest speakers um, here as well, panelists, to uh, share about accessibility. Um, just a few things to note, we do have a resources page. So if you are interested to know more about accessibility in the next couple of minutes, um, be sure to check out our resources page um, Gabby, if you can link it to the Figma, awesome. Um, there you'll find a few um, videos, articles, also stuff from Project Lima that we've been doing that we can share to you if you haven't checked it out. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes kind of um, waiting for people to trickle in. And as they trickle in, I also invite you to um, mingle and network in our Figma space. Make it super comfy, make it your home. Um, Customize your name cards whatever way you like. Um, it's a great way for us to get to know you and maybe reach out to you for any opportunities or if there are any potential collaborations that you'd like to reach out for, that would be great and swell as well. <laughs> cool. I'll just run through a bit of our agenda for today. So while you're just doing your activity, filling out your name cards, um, I'll run through a bit of the agenda. Hi, Fita. <laughs> I'm still represent. So today, we'll be um, doing a bit of networking for the first half an hour. Um, we'll fill out our name cards, customize it. There are stickers that you can check out and use. So feel free to go wild. And um, also, if you want to put in pull in emojis, that'll be a great time as well for you to kind of decorate your name cards. Hi, Eka from Jogja. Um, next, uh, at 10.30 um, Jakarta time or at 11.30 Singapore time, we'll have the presentation by Jeff Sundel. Now, he's a really cool guy. <laughs> we got to um, talk to him very briefly about accessibility and how he pioneers accessibility in LinkedIn. He is the accessibility lead there, and I'm super excited for him to be sharing. And I hope that you are too. Um, hopefully, we'll get a lot much stuff coming in from him as well. Later on, we're going to move into a panel discussion. And it's a great way for us to, you know, open up to a very more comfy situation, like just chill and ask the panelists, Aspia, Iswan, and Anga, who we have invited from different parts of uh, Southeast Asia, to talk a bit about what accessibility means to them and their, their, um, and their companies or their work. Yeah, Jay. <laughs> Good to see you here. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a really cool time. And then we're going to open up uh, question and answers to the audience. We're going to send you a link to um, Mentimeter. Um, and there we'll make sure that um, every uh, questions 
are logged in and you can either upvote or down or upvote the question so that more people get visibility on it and we make sure that question is prioritized. Towards the end of our uh, session today, we're, we're going to have a virtual photo booth. Now, if you fill out your name cards, those are the pictures that you are going to be seeing in your um, photo booth. And that's going to be a token that you can share at the end of this session as well. So, so be sure um, to, uh, to see that or to fill in your name card. Jeff is here uh, joining from Portland, Oregon. Thanks, Jeff, um, for joining in. We're super excited to have you here. So, yeah, yeah. If you can continue on the conversation in the chat, where you guys are from, which uh, city, um, and make sure that it's super interactive. I really like seeing how people are coming from different parts of uh, the world to this event. I'm really excited to be here as well. Um, so yeah, so I'll just show you um, what the Figma actually looks like. So if you can see my screen still here, we've got a networking tab. Oh, and I see a lot of people already in there. I'm super excited. I'm glad that you're here. Um, and yeah, you can customize with the different stickers that you have. Um, if you have any plugs as well, if you want to share something that you're working on or anything you'd like to shout out on, um, be sure to use my plugs sticker here. Hey, Jaya. Oh, you're from Universal Des National Institute of Design from India. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here. Yeah, for those of you just who just came in, um, feel free to join this first half hour session that we're going to do for some networking. You can create your name cards from the name card templates here. I hope everybody has that link, yeah? Gabby has made sure that everybody has the link. Just another info, um, Gabby, um, Vilya, and Tasha are going to be co-hosting the session with me. So if you have any technical difficulties, you can um, Zoom message them so, and they will be able to help you with any of your needs. Be sure to fill out your photos, guys, because those are the things that we're going to be looking out for and we'll be creating for your photo booth as well. Make it quirky, make it fun. It's going to be super cool. You can use avatars. You can take in pics from like the internet. <laughs> you can go wild here. Got a few people from Jokja, love in Jokja. Jakarta represent. Yes, I'm from Jakarta. Bogor, Murdy and Andrian from Bogor. Nice to see you here. Best day, nice. We got a few of our team members here from 62 as well. I want to give a shout out to them for their support. Thanks, guys. I hope you have a good start of the morning. Um, have your coffee already. It's gonna be a chill time for us to chat. So, um, yeah. Ah, Iswan is in the house. Our panelist Iswan is in the house.
Lalu Triawarni Novia Nung from Bandung. Hi. Yeah, so for those of you who just trickled in, we are currently doing our name cards. Um, you can head over to our uh, Figma where we can customize our name cards. And just an FYI for everybody, the pictures that you're going to be putting in your name card will be the pictures that we are going to uh, frame together as our virtual photo booth and for you to share with everybody. So be sure to fill out your name cards, uh, make it as fun um, as possible, fill in all your information, your bios, and if you have any plugs that you want to share with the world, you can do that as well. Um, we'd like to hear what you're working on and what you think inclusive design actually means. So head on over to the Figma um, and we'll, we'll see you here. In a couple of moments, we are going to be moving on to our next activity. It's going to be an interactive activity that I'd like to share um, a bit of a warm up to inclusive design as well. So um, I hope you're kind of wrapping up your name cards, um, finishing up there, and then we'll head on over to our next activity in about maybe two minutes. Is that good? Two minutes. Oh, I see IG there. Hey, IG. Just some air it out. Even the walls are changing too. Who's that? You tell me. Who's that? You. Oh, just ask me, please. Does it get easier to see who I am now? Who I am? I know you never told me all the things that you got from the guy you could see in your head. I, I hope everybody is familiar with Figma already. <gasps> I see everybody just jumping on it. So that's a good sign. Awesome. Now, if you're, if some of you are done with your um, moon cards, we are going to move on to our next event or next um, session, which is the secret mission page that you see in the Figma. Um, and we'll head on there. I'll explain the rules of play. Um, but basically, it's going to be a, a, a secret mission. It's a mission that um, we have assigned you to do. <laughs> and hopefully this could, you know, warm you up to um, designing a more inclusive design experience. So I'm still sharing my screen, but you can follow me on Figma. Um, my name is Vicky and I'll be your host today. So uh, you can follow me on Figma and the secret mission is shopping for these groceries. 
So you, you can see some of the labels here, they're in different colors. There's orange, there's green, there's yellow, there's purple, right? Now, I, we want you to purchase these groceries, right? And put them in your shopping bag. So down below, you can see uh, an empty space for your shopping bags. So grab a, grab a bag, claim one, put your name on your shopping bag. And over here in the top, we have aisle five. Now, aisle five is inspired by Project Lima because Lima actually translates to five in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, and you can duplicate it. So let's duplicate it. And you can see that there's no labels in here, right? That's the fun part of it. So duplicate your groceries into your shopping bag. And once you duplicate all your groceries into the shopping bag, you can actually find out what your results are when you view it as a prototype and you hover over these items. Sounds cool. Cool. Now let's get to it. Let's get shopping, guys. I know, in a Monday morning. I mean, not Monday morning, it's Saturday morning. <gasps> Getting groceries without labels and hoping to find that it matches, right? So claim your shopping bag, guys. We've got a few here. Um, label them with your name. Uh, copy your items. Let's make sure that everybody gets an item, right? <laughs> and let's see if your items match the shopping list, your secret mission. The goal here is to get as close as possible to this. Your mission here is to get as close as possible to these labels here, the colors. And you'll be able to find out the answers. When you're done, you can prototype your frame. Remember, you can prototype your frame and hover over the items to see whether or not it matches. Now you can share how yours turn out in the chat, how many you got right. We're gonna spend the next 10 minutes here before we actually open to our next session, which is Jeff's presentation. Two out of five, Gilang. Okay, wow. <laughs> Good job. At least you got one, uh, two right. I got none. <laughs> when I was doing this, I actually got nothing, <laughs> right? Let me know in the chat what you got. Mm -hmm. Now, as I see a few participants trickling in, um, just to give a bit of refresher what we're doing here, we're completing our secret missions, uh, an activity that we provided where you buy grocery items with unknown labels. So you'll have to match it without actually knowing the labels itself. But if you just came here, um, we'd like to invite you to our name cards so that you can fill out your name cards that would be available for your um, for networking to get to know other people as well. And also for our virtual photo booth at the end, we're gonna take that picture from your name card and we're going to give it to you uh, to share with your um, peers and colleagues. This country got one out of five. <laughs> two out of five. Good job, guys. Two out of five. Wow, we've got a lot of two out of five. Ooh, Joshua is winning it. Three out of five. He is in the lead. Oh, Alia is tying up with Joshua. Good one, good one there. 
Oh, look at that. Ideal out of Budiman got four out of five. That's like a plus, like an A plus. <laughs> Maybe not the perfect grade yet. We'll see if we get any perfect. Um, but Ideal out of Budiman, you're, you're leading it. Ooh, shout out to whoever choose this playlist. Gabby, that belongs to you. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Oh, Diodona wants the Figma link there. I'll help. try to see if somebody can help you out there. There you go. Oh. There's the link. Thank you, Gabby. Anybody else got your shopping bag is completed? So for those of you who are done, um, I'd like to show you. Uh, so this is actually the whole point of this um, secret mission is actually at the end over here. Um, there's this group called RNIB. And they actually have this video uh, for the people with visual ex uh, impairment experiences. So if you... Are interested to know what happens behind I mean like how they came up with this interaction we'd like to credit them as well right RNIB there is a link over here that you can check out so for those of you who are done you can check out this um, for for to take a look take into consideration of how other groups have been um, you know take uh, accounted for when designing products so that accessibility and inclusivity can be further championed for everybody. So this is your mission debrief. You can reflect on your experience. Yeah. Oh, Rahma, hi. Nice. Good to see you here. But yes, um, RNIB, uh, super cool. Uh, I encourage you if you want to learn more about um, this, this experience and how they came up with this. Basically, the whole act activity is inspired by them and taken from them. So check it out. Check out the video if you want to learn more. Yeah. We'll spend uh, another three minutes in this activity for you to um, uh, finish up what you're doing. Either you want to go back to your name cards or if you want to check out the video or if you want to fill in more shopping bags, right? Try your chances, get more, maybe more corrects. It's up to you, but we're going to wrap it up in three minutes. Yes, so Gilang, um, the, the Figma file is going to be open, um, but it's not going to be um, for long but we are going to make it available for you to download any uh, assets that you need, including the photo booth that we're going to be sharing at the end of the session. So yes, you're going to be able to access it in the future as well.
but maybe in a shortened, shortened period of time. Cool. If you guys have any questions about um, anything, you can just drop it out in the chat. Um, I, I can answer it verbally. Or there's also Gabby here from our team. There's Vilia and Tasha. Um, they'll be able to answer any of your questions. Um, you can also uh, private Zoom chat them and they'll be able to answer any of your needs as well. Hi, Aspia. Our panelist, Aspia, is also here, guys. We are so excited to be in the same space with these people, right? Yes. Glad to see you here. So just a bit of um, brief for anybody who's just joining in. We're doing a little activity here um, on inclusive experiences, um, making sure that we are labeling things properly, right? As we are designing for those who are disabled or, um, or yeah. Uh, and if you also just jumped in, we are also filling out name cards. Uh, it's a great way for us to continue networking, even though we are in an event that is virtual. Right? We would like to obviously make friends, connect with new people, connect with interesting people. You can find it in the name cards page, if this Figma, and you can take a look around as well. Um, and that name card is going to be used to um, frame our photo booths at the end for you to share as well. <laughs> We are starting Metaverse, Jay. <laughs> the only thing is that we haven't made custom avatars. Usually in our events, we do have custom avatars, but not, not today. Anyway, we're all out of time for our activities. Um, you can continue doing what you're doing. Feel free to just play around the Figma. I'll pass this time to actually Vilya for to introduce um, our speaker. Vilya. Hello. Can you guys hear Hi. me? Hi. Yes. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. I've just been uh, chatting quite a bit with you guys on chat. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's good to be speaking to you all. Thank you for being here today. It's morning, Sunday morning. I know you'd probably rather be uh, eating dim sum or anything else <laughs> around this really time or, <laughs> or <Thank> sleep. <laughs> but uh, super, super excited for you guys to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait for the next, what, an hour and a half uh, together with you guys. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm here to open this up um, and uh, uh, we'll uh, introduce our speakers. Um, the first one is Jeff. Um, and so the next 30 minutes, well, 20, 20, 25 minutes or so, uh, we're going to be hearing from Jeff, um, where he's actually going to be sharing a bit about um, justifying and measuring success on um, uh, inclusive design projects in organizations. And so um, a bit of background. So Vicky and I um, got connected with Jeff uh, a few, a couple of months ago now, um, and uh, we had a really, really nice chat about um, how he's been championing um, inclusive and accessible design at LinkedIn's design team. Um, he's actually currently sitting in Oregon, um, in Portland, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so I really, really appreciate um, his time here. It's uh, about 8 p.m. his time. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that he's uh, spending his uh, Friday um, evening uh, with all of us here in Southeast Asia. So thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and uh, uh, I guess so over to you uh, to uh, share what uh, you have to share. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much, Vilia. I'll share my screen here. Um, mm -hmm. and I can have a, I don't, I don't have a cool kind of like soundtrack going on, uh, behind, behind me, but, uh, but hopefully this will work for sharing. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up from yes. Vicky? Awesome. Cool. That works too. Yeah. You all see my screen. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, well, so yeah, th thanks so much Vilia for the introduction. That's, uh, um, it's really an honor to be here. It's uh, a cool opportunity for me to, to join in in a community that, 
Um, I really probably don't have a lot of opportunity to, to interact with otherwise, just given the opposite side of the world that I'm on. Um, but this is such a cool opportunity for me to be able to share some of my, my perspective and experience. Um, although if I'm honest, I'm going to kind of try to get through this as fast as I can, because I'm really excited for the panel and to engage with this community and kind of learn what I can from you. So, um, so without further ado, I guess I, I will be sharing some of my perspective here, such as it is. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, measuring and motivating and justifying accessibility and inclusive design. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, it's really based on my perspective in the last decade or so that I've been uh, a designer, uh, you know, UX designer, product designer. Um, and uh, I, for the last couple of years, being the inclusive design lead at LinkedIn, where I've been able to kind of develop a new program and a new way of thinking about uh, accessibility and inclusive design within LinkedIn. Um, although I think like a lot of the folks in the room, I would guess uh, you probably share uh, that we've taken very circuitous paths to get into where we are in design. Um, a lot of different backgrounds. And that's one of the things I really love about our industry is that we tend to see people come from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, one of the things that tends to recur in the theme of my background where I got here um, is that I love to learn. And I'm, I'm always learning. I'm always kind of thinking like, what else don't I know? What, what else can I learn? Who can I learn from? Um, and one of the things that comes with learning and being inquisitive is that I read a lot. And uh, if you're at this event, I'm guessing you're probably a learner too. You probably read quite a lot. Um, right now we have a, a photo of a book on the screen, um, the kind of traditional kind of print book, uh, hardcover it looks like. Uh, but there are a lot of other formats that books come in these days as well. There's there are eBooks, um, and we have uh, audiobooks. You might be reading in other formats as, or other kind of form factors as well, like articles and whatnot. But with uh, audiobooks, and I'd be curious in the chat here, how many folks on the call have listened to an audiobook recently? Um, and if you have, uh, what was the title? Like, what, what did you listen to? Was it something fun, something nonfiction, fiction? Um, genres are welcome. Uh, I'd love to, I'd be curious to see uh, what you're reading or what you're listening to. The, I would call it audiobook specifically because um, I read an article not too long ago that, that talked about audiobooks and it surprised me. It got me kind of going down the rabbit hole of internet history, fact finding um, to try to learn more. Um, because it turns out audiobooks have a much older history than I was aware of. And it's one that's rooted in uh, disability and inclusion. Um, back in the 1930s, uh, the American Foundation for the Blind worked with the, the US government um, to take advantage of this new emerging technology that was vinyl records. Um, to provide access to literature for people who are blind. Now, a vinyl record can only hold about 20 minutes of audio, so it's not like they were fitting whole books on each record, um, but it was providing access to literature in a way that hadn't been possible for people who are blind up until that point. I mean, it was really kind of a cool way to, to remove a barrier that existed. Um, this developed even further in the 1940s um, and again happening in the United States. This is the story that I had access to anyways. I'm sure there were more developments outside of the US as well. Um, where in the 1940s we had soldiers coming back from World War II in the United States and they had this promise from the government to have access to higher education in reward for their service in the military. Um, but what a lot of these soldiers encountered when they went to go to university was that the, uh, the vision impairment and blindness that they may have acquired during their service in the military blocked them from access to that higher education because they weren't able to read the textbooks. So again, the government stepped in and used this vinyl technology, this audiobook technology to provide access to these textbooks for these, uh, these blind students. But it wasn't until about 1969 when another technology emerged, um, the cassette tape, that allowed entire books to fit on a single cassette or maybe a couple cassette tapes um, and use a technology that, that uh, people in general more broadly had access to. Um, and then this led into uh, CDs and digital audio um, and eventually led to this market that today is worth over $2 billion globally, um, this audiobook market. And it's still growing pretty rapidly, especially in some markets, uh, and some of those are, I think some of the, the fastest growing markets for audiobooks are in Southeast Asia. Now, 
I didn't, I didn't dig deep enough to get all the data for all the different markets. Um, but one of them being where I am, I think I had access to US data um, much more easily. And I can say that in the US in, in 2019, there were about 48 million people who listened to audiobooks. Um, so 48 million, this is a pretty big number. Um, but at that time period, uh, there are only about a million people who are permanently blind in the US. So at some point there was this diversion a divergence between audiobooks being for people who are blind and audiobooks being for a lot larger group of people. And you, anybody who has listened to audiobooks or who's responding in the chat um, that they love audiobooks or have listened to them recently, you probably intuitively can kind of think about like, well, of course there's benefit to other people. Um, so that's, and that's kind of exactly what I'm getting to. Um, the, the benefit that this technology or this, this application of the technology um, has on the broader society or on the broader, broader market is much bigger than uh, the people who are permanently impaired. Um, and this is another area where I would, I'd be interested to hear kind of when last time you listened to an audiobook, what were you doing while you listened to the audio, audiobook? Um, it, could have, uh, it could be that you just prefer to listen to audiobooks. That's how you like to engage with literature. Um, but yeah, what else were you doing? Were you, uh, we had driving in there Maybe you were uh, cooking or doing the dishes or watching your kid. Maybe you were going for a walk. Um, maybe you couldn't use your eyes for some reason. Like maybe you just came out of a doctor's appointment or like a uh, uh, an eye doctor appointment and your eyes were dilated. You couldn't see. Um, whatever the reason, uh, some of you are probably listening to audiobooks because you're using your eyes for something else. And that's something that... Uh, would count as a disability, maybe not in a medical sense, maybe not in a statistics sense, um, but it is something that we can expand our scope of what we mean when we talk about disability um, to, to cover. Um, because the effect of not being able to use your eyes for something gives you this experience of disability where I'm not able to use my eyes because I'm driving, um, so I can't read a book. But if I could consume that content in a different way, I would still be able to engage with it. Um, and similarly, if I'm temporarily disabled because of the eye doctor, or maybe because I have cataracts um, and I haven't gotten into the surgery for my cataracts yet, I, I, I would still be able to engage with this literature if it, had, if it came in some other um, medium. And that's kind of what's happening with, for at least some of these 48 million people who listen to audiobooks in the United States. Uh, at least some of them were temporarily and situationally disabled, um, probably a lot of them actually. These figures that I'm using on the screen, uh, and for those of you who can't see the screen, I have figures on the screen here that represent a person who's permanently impaired uh, and blind, uh, somebody who's got a temporary impairment of cataracts, and somebody who's situationally impaired for driving. And these figures come from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, which is a really great resource that you can dig into if you haven't already. They're part of what's called the disability matrix, where we have a rows representing the temporal aspect of disability, like permanent impairments, temporary impairments, and situational impairments. And the columns represent the different abilities, like see, hear, touch, and speak. What this uh, disability matrix does, it, and we can use this as designers or people working uh, in design adjacent fields, to, uh, again, kind of expand the way that we think about disability. Um, the, it's especially useful for applying one of the principles of inclusive design, which is solve for one extent to many. Where if we can solve for an extreme set of constraints, like somebody who's permanently impaired, somebody who's permanently missing an arm, for instance, the solution that we come up with for that person, if we can extend it to everyone, also ends up benefiting the person who's temporarily unable to use their arm, maybe because it's injured. Or, or the person who's not able to use their arm because they're a new parent and they're holding their child or they're carrying some heavy bags. And that's kind of what happened in the audiobook scenario. Um, this audiobook uh, technology is a, a really good example of that. Okay, I, that may have been uh, stating the obvious for some of you if you're more into inclusive design already, um, but I love that exploration of audiobooks and that kind of light bulb moment for me when I was reading this was like, oh, I thought audiobooks were just a thing that publishers came up with, but it was something more than that. Um, it represented a different way of thinking about solving problems. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about 
uh, how we as designers or in design adjacent fields um, involved in product development think about disability and apply it to our trade or, and apply it to our design problems. Uh, how you approach accessibility or inclusive design will depend on where you are in your journey as well as where your company is in its journey. And understanding where you are and where your company is or where your society is, is really important to, to knowing kind of how you can make the right kind of impact and how you can insert this into your work. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, where most people tend to start or the default kind of mindset that I, I think most people tend to have. And this is based on maturity models that I've read from a bunch of different folks. I'm kind of trying to distill it down into something that's really uh, kind of simple to present. Uh, but pretty much everybody starts in this kind of reactive sp space um, and reactive in the sense that you're not going to do it unless there's an outside force that that uh, causes you to have to do it. Um, so this could, this outside force could be something like a legal framework where there's a law that says you have to um, build things accessibly, which is the case in the United States, it's the case in Europe, um, it may not be the case in a lot of regions in, in Southeast Asia. Um, there could also be social pressure if there's a cultural attitude of inclusion of disability, um, that outside pressure could come in the form of a social media post that calls out uh, your, your uh, product's lack of accessibility. It could be a news article that puts your company in bad light. Um, and again, that depends on whether it's the legal framework or the cultural attitude. It, it depends on something that's outside of you and outside of your company um, to force you to act and react really. Um, and if those outside forces aren't there, you kind of have to do something different. I mean, you might still default to this state where you're just not gonna do something without those outside forces, but the outside forces aren't there. So you end up just not doing anything. The proactive approach is something that I've seen, um, it seems to happen when this, those outside forces exist uh, in a kind of persistent way, um, like so over time. Um, and the proactive approach uh, basically involves saying like, well, we're tired of reacting to this uh, in a kind of unexpected way. Um, so we're gonna try to anticipate what the problems might be and address them be before somebody else calls them out. Uh, and so you're still depending on those, you're still acting kind of in, in anticipation of those outside forces. That's kind of your main motivator. Um, but what we tend to see in the proactive approach is testing right before launch or maybe right after launch before anybody has had time to notice, um, so to speak, uh, or, uh, or maybe even shifting left in your process and trying to get earlier and earlier in your, uh, in your product development life cycle to um, maybe design things right the first way so you don't introduce bugs into the experience. Okay, so this is reactive and proactive. Both of these depend a lot on accessibility standards, like a, a checklist, a way of, uh, of standardized, standardized way of measuring whether you're meeting accessibility uh, best practices or like the, the minimum that you need to do. Um, and when we talk about accessibility standards, when I say that, uh, what I'm talking about is, is usually the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG. Um, now, don't let the, the W in that, the web, um, mislead you. They are made by the, the World Wide Web Consortium. They are made primarily for web, but these standards apply to any digital experience and the science underpinning them, you can apply to a lot of non-digital experiences as well. Um, but the web standards exist for a very specific reason, and it's to it's to provide a baseline of what the what has to be there for people with specific disabilities to have basic access to uh, the the experiences. Um, and that I want to emphasize that basic access piece of this because another way of thinking about accessibility standards is that they they lead you to a minimally usable experience for people with certain types of disabilities. Um, and it's not, this is not a way, this is not me trying to say like, oh, well, don't, th th this means the accessibility standards don't matter. That's certainly not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they exist to provide kind of a, a minimum. And in any other aspect of our uh, user experience design, we would never aim for the minimum. If you were in user research and you heard a user uh, in some maybe user research that doesn't have anything to do with ac accessibility or disability, and you heard one of the participants in research say, yeah, this was okay. It was really hard to use, but I guess it's fine. Um, that you would that would be a bad outcome in your user research, right? You would you would say 
this isn't good enough. We need to go back to the drawing board. What you want to hear is your participants saying, that was amazing. I loved it. It was easy to use. I want to use it again. When you aim for the accessibility standards, when you aim for that minimally usable experience, you're aiming for that kind of, yeah, it was okay. It was hard to use, but I was able to get the job done, I guess. This leads us to kind of the next stage of accessibility maturity, where we actually maybe get away from accessibility maturity and we start getting into inclusion maturity. And this is what inclusive design is all about. It's basically saying, let's move beyond the reactive um, or proactive approach where we're depending on some outside force to tell us that we need to do the bare minimum um, and move into a, a domain where we're looking at um, creating something that actually works for everyone and maximizing who can use our products. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna shift gears again a little bit and talk about how do we measure and motivate using these things, um, using these frameworks. And again, some of you may be in organizations where you are doing that reactive approach or where you are doing that proactive approach. Um, and and uh, so if you find yourself in that reactive approach, what you're measuring and how you're motivating is gonna be based on those external forces. You're gonna be measuring kind of what's the cost of the legal effort required to respond to this uh, lawsuit, basically. Somebody suing you because you didn't meet the, the legal requirements. Maybe there's a settlement or a court action. And so you have to respond to that legal action. And there's a cost to that, legal fees maybe. Um, there's also maybe the PR cost or the customer support cost of fielding uh, tickets or, or, uh, or, or addressing social media backlash. Uh, but whatever it is, you, your, your motivation is to try to lower these costs. Um, and, and this is why the reactive approach, uh, this is one of the many reasons, I guess, why the reactive approach tends to not result in the best user experience and, and doesn't really lead to inclusion because you're really just trying to avoid um, incurring these costs. The proactive approach um, because you are trying to get ahead of things, you're trying to anticipate where there might be problems, um, you're using those accessibility standards to, as kind of a checklist to evaluate your process or your products rather. Um, and so you're gonna be measuring the number of, of accessibility bugs and maybe the severity of accessibility bugs. Uh, and your goal, your motivation here, their justification for the work that you're doing is to lower the cost of fixing those accessibility bugs. Um, so whether you're doing your testing maybe right before launch or right after launch, or maybe you're doing testing even earlier than that, um, all of it is kind of all about reducing the cost to fix bugs. And then also maybe trying again, kind of reaching back to the previous uh, re reactive approach, trying to reduce uh, the risk of lawsuits or social backlash if it's there. So this is mo measuring reactive and measuring proactive. When it comes to um, if, if you're in an environment where there isn't that uh, legal framework that requires accessibility, or there isn't that social or cultural framework uh, or value um, that requires disability inclusion, accessibility might not really make a lot of sense. Um, and, and, and this is one of the things that I learned when I was talking with, with Vicky and Vilia was, um, I don't know a ton about South, Southeast Asian um, cultural values. And so I was a little bit surprised when I, when I learned like, uh, oh, there, there actually is a very different way of thinking about disability in Southeast Asian cultures generally, where disability isn't socially accepted. There, it carries a very big sig stigma. Um, and, and so accessibility uh, on the face of it may not be something that is, um, is going to motivate a lot of your partners. It may not make a lot of sense um, to try to go and try to get buy-in on working on accessibility. But when you unpack what's happening, like what the accessibility standards are uh, are saying, where they come from, the science underpinning them, uh, what it what all of these accessibility standards are are ways of making your products more usable. Um, and so you could start to reframe this in terms of instead of instead of focusing focusing on accessibility bugs. You could try to reframe these as usability bugs, but you're starting to do, when you do that, uh, you might be able to make an impact and, and, uh, and make your products more accessible kind of indirectly, but you start to lose sight of why you're doing this. Um, and so I, I generally uh, would be cautious about taking this approach. Instead, I think if you it, for the, the Southeast Asian kind of region where there might be not, there might not be the legal framework for requiring accessibility, that kind of outside pressure, 
or there might not be the cultural values that are expecting disability inclusion, uh, it might be better to, to skip the reactive and proactive approaches altogether and go straight to inclusive design. Um, and the reason for this is that with inclusive design, you're trying to, uh, the goal of inclusive design is to reframe who you're considering to be your users. So before I talk about measuring and motivation, it might be worth kind of unpacking some of the, the statistics that we can talk about with inclusive design and with disability. Um, right now in, in the world, there are, uh, there are about 15% of the global population that has a disability. And here we're talking about permanent impairments. Um, so 50% of the global population. Um, and when we look at regions like the US or the UK, um, it's more like 20 or 25%. And I wouldn't take that as saying that there's more disability in the US or the UK. It's, it may just be that there's less social stigma around um, disability. And so uh, people may be more willing to disclose that they have a disability on a census or a survey or something like that. Um, but even if we take this more conservative figure of 15% of the global population has a permanent impairment uh, and then combine that with Another statistic, which is that about half of all disability is invisible, which is to say it's not apparent when you look at somebody or when you talk to somebody or when you work next to somebody that they have a disability. It's not apparent and, they, and because maybe of the stigma or a fear of discrimination, they keep their disability to themselves and they don't tell people about it. They don't announce it um, and they, they cope with it on their own terms, which may mean that they have a very hard time um, living their lives. So if you combine these two things, um, what, you can, uh, what can motivate you is that 15% of the population, which means 15% or more of your user base, the target market that you're trying to reach, likely has a disability, even if they're not disclosing it, even if you don't know about it. So it means that 15% of your target market either has a really hard time using the products that you design that don't account for them, um, or they don't use your products at all. And you're not, you're not getting that uh, advantage of their kind of economic input, their, their, their spending on your product, if you will. So in business sense, uh, that's kind of how you'd frame it. Um, so what are you measuring here? You're measuring just the overall user experience. The only thing that's changing is that you're redefining who you mean by your user. You're being more intentional and explicit about making sure that you've got representation of disability in your user base. So when you're doing your research, this could mean recruiting people with disabilities more explicitly, being, being sure that you've got that representation. It could mean representing disability in your personas or other design artifacts, and just being more explicit about that. And when you do so, um, what the, the effect that you're looking for, the motivation for all of this, is that it, it's, it's not some other thing that you're measuring. It's not something that's accessibility specific. It's your core business metrics. Um, it's, your, it's your core business success that, uh, that should improve because you're getting access to more of your users and you're creating a more usable experience for your users. And sometimes if you go to kind of the extreme here where you start with disability, you start with your disabled um, users and you sp solve specifically the problems that they're encountering or the barriers that they're encountering or the ways that they use technology, you may even find that you create entirely new business opportunity. <clears throat> this is the audiobook story, basically. You found a, a problem that didn't exist for anybody else, but by solving it and then opening that up to everyone else, you've not just increased your ability to compete with your competitors, you've created an entirely new market. Um, and this is a really powerful sort of thing to do um, that just comes from tapping into the diversity of experience, the diversity of thought that exists in disability that's often neglected. Okay, so I've talked a lot. I'm, I'm actually super stoked to get to this panel and to hear questions and to, and to engage in the discussion. Before I do, I'll leave you with a couple uh, parting thoughts, some advice, if you will. So organizations like people often need a little bit of a nudge to start doing anything. Um, so that nudge, as I was kind of referring to in that re reactive and proactive uh, maturity levels, uh, that nudge often is coming from the outside. It could be a legal requirement, it could be customer demand, social values, um, but it can also come internally. It could be a new CEO or a new 
senior leader who maybe has an undisclosed disability or a personal experience with disability, a family member or a friend that is disabled, and they've brought that experience with them into your organization and are, are, they care about it and they maybe want to do something about it. It could also be you. It could be you and your peers who are um, passionate about this and you just want to find ways to insert it into your work. If that's the case, if you're the one that wants to go and start doing this in your work, you don't necessarily need to go ask for permission. Um, and you also don't need to do something huge. You can find little ways to insert accessibility and inclusive design process into your work. You can go to those accessibility standards and unpack them, study them, try to understand what's actually going on inside that standard. Why does it exist? Why does it benefit people with disabilities? And how could it benefit everybody? And then just find ways to insert that into your design solutions. Um, people who have mobility impairments need to be able to use keyboard alone. And that's an accessibility standard. But it turns out lots of people benefit when we build keyboard operation into our um, user experience for all of our devices um, and, and for whatever reason. And you can unpack that. I, I'd encourage you to explore that. And just all of the accessibility standards have these little gems of insights that you can, you can tap into even if you're not able to get access to people with disabilities uh, in your research or on your teams. The other thing too is to seek out allies. Um, so go and look for those partners um, in your organization that are also curious and who are also inquisitive and who want uh, to, to pursue this as well. And the, I've found this in the least likely places. Sometimes I'm working with an engineer who just seems to want to close a bug. And when I'm able to talk with them about why we're, why we're trying to address this thing, why is this thing a problem? Who does it actually affect? Um, I often find that by the time I'm done having that conversation with that engineer, they become my ally. They become a champion of their own. They're like, oh, I really like this. I had no idea that this was a thing. And then my final part, and I know I'm a little bit over, uh, approaching <laughs> over time, I guess, um, but this quote from Sherry Burn Haver is one that I wanted to leave you with, which is that accessibility is a program, not a project. Um, so access, uh, Sherry Burn Haver is a, an accessibility architect at VMware. She's one of the people that I regularly look to for accessibility insights. Um, but uh, it, it, uh, there's, there can be this misconception, especially for people just getting into accessibility that they just need to do like one project to make their, their um, products accessible and then they'll just stay accessible somehow. But that's not really what it's about. Again, kind of this, this, uh, what we need is that mindset shift toward inclus inclusive design and inclusive products where you're infusing your practice with accessibility and disability inclusion. Um, and to do that, it requires kind of ongoing work and ongoing cultivation. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. I'm really stoked to hear the discussion and be part of uh, the panel. Uh, so let's shift over to that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing. That was super insightful. I think it's a great um, way where we can start, um, you know, measuring accessibility and how our company is doing in terms of accessibility, right? Whether we're in that proactive state, reactive or reactive, proactive, and then inclusive um, state, I think that that shows the maturity. Um, so yeah, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to be moving on to our panel discussion. Um, I'll be bringing up some of the panelists. So um, I'll introduce them starting from Aspia. So Aspia is, um, She's our senior design operations uh, manager at Grab. Uh, so Grab is the Uber equivalent of uh, Southeast Asia. And her main focus these days are leading design ops. Um, and also she's a veteran in both design and engineering domains. So in the past, Aspia worked in PayPal, developing global web platforms while promoting technology operation excellence. So hi, Aspia. Nice to see you here. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I hope you're, you got your coffee already and got... I have somewhat you. half of a coffee. I haven't finished it yet, but it, <laughs> I'm getting there. Cool. Really cool. Excitement. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invite. Great uh, presentation, Jeff. Very insightful. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would love to listen to more, uh, definitely about inclusiveness and in design and how we can promote that because I think there's a... There's a conception that inclusive design is 
only about limitations um, and how do we proceed to, to, in, to, to not make it a limitation, right? In terms of the work that we do, whether we're an engineering researcher or designer, I would like to hear more from the audience and also the panel on how we, how we think about inclusive design and how do we not make that a weakness in a way, not into the, the business, but in the way we work and the way we think. I think that that opportunity to learn and do more and do well, uh, I want to learn more about that. Yeah, cool, cool stuff. Uh, thanks for sharing, Aspia. I'll bring up our next panel, Iswan. Um, Iswan is a design leader and entrepreneur with over a decade of experience uh, that encompasses startups, uh, scale-ups and corporations um, and as a founder and curator of UX Malaysia is one has also been actively building the digital design scene for the past decade. Hi is one how are you doing? Hey everyone nice to see everyone here doing all right pretty excited um, I think there's a bit of an echo the room is empty I just moved into a house. Ah, <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you thank you. Um, yeah um, i Really, really good stuff, Jeff. I, I was like listening through, and I was like uh, pretty inspired by by the the approach and the sharing. And I think there's a lot to learn, definitely, and a lot to discuss. I think what I want out of this panel and discussion with everyone here is just to really bring out all this like like gems of um, inclusive design and every little aspect of it, whether it is for the disability or the disabled or the challenge. Or is it also inclusive of the tier uh, within the society itself, right? That's also part of uh, inclusive design. Looking yeah. forward. Cool, cool stuff. Thanks for sharing, is one. And uh, I'll bring up our last panel, which is Anga. So Anga, for the past decade, he has been advocating intentional design practice in startups, in public sectors, in consulting as well, um, and capitalistic corporations. He currently speaks, seeks redemption by working in GovTech at Telcom, where he leads a band of designers and researchers to collaborate with the Ministry of Education, solving some of Indonesia's most wicked education challenge. We're so excited to have you here, Anga. It's been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> yeah. How are you feeling? Good to, good, good to see everyone here. Um, honestly, I'm as clueless as most people here about inclusive design. So I think let's just see this experience as a way to learn from each other. Uh, looking forward and please ask a lot of questions, guys. Thanks. Yes. Speaking of questions, we do have a few questions trickling in in Mentimeter. Um, we'll send in the link again in the chat or I think... I'll share as well. I think we have a QR code that I can like flash over here in the screen. Um, how do I do that? Okay, right. So yeah, I think like um, to start off, um, I'm interested to see like uh, what are your perceptions on inclusive design and how do you incorporate it in your um, work force, whether it's existing or non-existent, um, how do you usually go about inclusive design and what was your take on it um, in your day-to-day? -day? Maybe we can start with, with Jeff because you are heading it in LinkedIn, right? <laughs> I, yeah, so I could talk about uh, some of the stuff that we're doing. I'll, I'll try to keep it pretty like high level and, and short at first, at least. Um, so the, there are a few things that we do. So, so LinkedIn does the like proactive, a lot of the proactive approach and has shifted left really significantly. So we're, we do a lot of the testing pre-release, we do post-release testing, uh, but the inclusive design, the inclusive like practice that we're, we're doing um, is, uh, is still really very nascent. And so we're doing things around um, trying to infuse certain aspects of our price, price, practice um, with inclusion. And that means uh, research, targeting um, research and, and making sure that we have the infrastructure in place to be able to recruit people with disabilities um, mm -hmm. for studies and to get that representation in our research. Um, and then also uh, that requires a certain amount of training for designers and researchers who are preparing for that training. Um, I, I think if you go and try to recruit somebody who is uh, blind to be part of a study, um, and you're trying to get their input on a prototype, you might encounter two, two kind of conflicting problems where you, 
the the tools that you're using for research or the methods that you're used to using for research um, don't necessarily account for how a blind user might be using technology or right. like the screen readers that they're using. And then similarly, the prototyping tools that we tend to use in design um, maybe don't work at all. Like maybe they're just not accessible. So the screen reader goes to try to use them mm. and it, it just can't, it can't do it. And, the, and, and you, you have to find a different way um, to approach that different way to try to get the insights. Nice. Um, nice. And so that's a big part of it. Uh, and then a bit, another big part of it is just educating designers and normalizing um, uh, the attitudes around uh, disability. So making sure designers understand the diversity of disability, um, as well as uh, understanding how to, how to incorporate that into their work. Um, and maybe starting with a, a select few things like picking out um, a handful of standards that we can focus on as designers and make the biggest impact on instead of throwing, you know, the entire WCAG uh, at every designer and saying, hey, you need to do all of this. All of, um, all of this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be overwhelming for most designers. Um, right. So, so we, we pick out the ones that are most impactful um, yeah, based on the data that we have about uh, where we tend to see problems and where we um, where we can do better, uh, especially where designers can make the biggest impact. Cool, cool. So I'm hearing that there's like a part in the development side where you make sure during the end to end process it's kind of um, already inclusively checked, um, and also there is the research part where making sure you're using user testing it to um, a diverse group of users, and also there's the educational aspect. Um, making sure that the designers are being proactively fed with resources about um, inclusivity and diversity. Um, cool, really cool stuff. Um, I guess like we can move on to the other panelists. Aspia, do you, is there anything that, um, you know, Grab does specifically to cater to inclusion? Um, um, I won't speak a lot on, on behalf of Grab because <laughs> End of the day, there's a lot of things I don't know what's happening in Grab because it's doing everything at the same time. Mm. I'll just be very honest about that. Um, but from my, my experiences before and until now, I have picked up certain practices whereby I am uh, quite proud that they, they kind of implemented uh, mm. in ways of trying to say, not trying to say, trying to show at least that there is a, a sense of empathy mm. and a sense of wanting to do good. Uh, I think if you give an opportunity for people to do good, they will do good. That's one of the things that I, I kind of like had a, a good grasp of. And what I sensed was that when I was working in my prior companies, they do have a very mature set of understanding of limitation of uh, disabilities. And they mm -hmm. hire people off, uh, of the mm -hmm. set, the set uh, difficulties that they have day to day. Mm -hmm. And um, they were champions within the, the companies themselves in trying to promote uh, accessibility in the certain standards. Uh, I will not pick on this, the specific limitations that they have, okay, but I've seen them brilliantly able to develop and code. I'm seeing them able to brilliantly inspire people around them about, yes, I have a limitation, but does not stop me from living a very fulfilling life. So uh, as an employer, I, I hope that we do more of that, right, uh, to hire more people with limitations, uh, not um, exclude them based on those limitations. That's one thing. If you have any company that does that, it's, it's key in terms of trying to include um, accessibility or not accessibility, inclusion mm -hmm. into uh, how we work as a culture. Uh, the other aspect is that these champions, these, these folks who have those uh, special needs, they were able to illustrate to us more more clearly uh, what those challenges are in opposed to us as was able to do it uh, without any problem. They, they were able to create experience centers that kind of like mimics the limitation that one has. And that is the thing that I wish we could do more, which is showcase those, those challenges. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's the prior workplace, the current one in Grab. I, I am happy to say that we have something that we do at a company level where we talk about inclusion and then it's not again, specifically about disabilities. Okay, what is the meaning of inclusion? We're not talking specifically about, hey, because that fellow has a limitation, we must do this in this way. 
something that there is no business justification and that to like propel that impact, right? Propel that result. So we have to like think about it uh, as my, my, my statement, what do you guys put on those cards below? We have to think about inclusion from the foundations and how that happens within my domain of work is to include that in the standards of design or the foundations of design. Mm -hmm. um, this did not come on the result of I tell my team, my team are the ones that I hired to like think about those things. And right. I was proud to say that they followed the WCAG about color contrast and then included that into our design standards. And that was not a small project. We had mm -hmm. to like audit the massive amount of the experiences, the multiple development teams and designers to understand what color palettes are you using and shrink that into a very, um, curate, not curated, um, but best practice vetted tool yeah. uh, so that we use that as a standard and we enforce that as a standard with all the proactive, reactive justifications that we can find and push that forth. And then you can scale that at impact. So that's how I'm practicing it now uh, mm -hmm. within my own domain. But as I said, uh, certain things that the company has done was to hire people uh, with limitations or special needs um, to do more wherever they can, areas where we know it can flow at scale rather than keep hopping on the limitation, just keep hopping on the good, uh, yeah. what it means to be able to do this, right? So I think yeah. that's one or a few ways that we can do uh, inclusion. Yeah, yeah, I like your approach there where you take on that side of empathy, right? Where you hire more people so that we'll be able to, you know, be closer to them and in a way kind of seek validation from them in a way. Um, <laughs> but like it, it gives, it, it, it definitely gives it a bit of a difference if you, are, you have a friend or you have a coworker who is uh, disabled, right? You will be able to perceive things differently as well. And I'm really glad that you kind of brought that up because like, um, it just forces or not forces it just enables us to see things in different perspectives right like especially if we're hiring a more diverse group of people we definitely see way more perspectives we see their edge cases and we can identify them as well so that's a really good um angle there aspia um is one um let's talk about you like how how do you how would you approach um inclusion in your day-to-day -day design practice uh, i think that's a great question i think um, just a bit of a background. So I work in a bank um, and it's very different in terms of governance and, and, mm. and stuff like that, right? So, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff to go through. Um, but recently we've started to have this conversation about uh, being more inclusive in terms of the design in our application and our website, the uh, right usage of fonts so that people can read properly yeah. um, and so forth. I mean, it's not as advanced as, as what Jeff and Asia is going through. But it's a start, and I think I think that's a key thing. Yeah. And being that my my background is is an in industrial design, um, so the terminology of universal design has always been there. Right? It's like making sure that the door opens right, making sure that the handle actually communicates what it's supposed to do. Um, and with that, I kind of like pass it over to the team. It's like, hey, you know, we need to figure this out. We need to understand like there are different levels of users. Um, and we need to kind of like, at, at best, the common things that they do will communicate what it should communicate. I think that is the start that, that we're having. And, but of course, I'm looking to kind of push this even further and, and be a lot more elaborate and more um, uh, thoughtful in terms of what we do. Cool, cool. Um, you mentioned a bit about universal design. Could you explain a bit more on that? Because I know some some of the audience here might not be acc accustomed to it. Yeah, sure. Um, so universal design is, is kind of like a terminology used by the um, architects as well as industrial design designers uh, in terms of like, let's say if you design a building, it needs to kind of um, uh, have path for everyone. So meaning that everyone can access this building if there's stairs, then there should be a ramp, right? Right. Uh, making sure that someone with a wheelchair is able to actually access the second floor uh, without mm -hmm. having to kind of dismount um, the, the wheelchair and so forth. And in terms for industrial design, where we start to design more chairs um, or tables that would fit different types of uses, um, whether the table is adjusted, 
according to you know um, the type of, of disability or challenge that the person is facing, or even the type of scissors. So I think a very famous case study by IDEO is like they redesigned the scissors for to include someone with uh, left hand capability instead of just right handed, right? Oh. And they redesigned that so that can be used by both hands. Mm. Um, so that's kind of like the gist of uh, universal design really cool stuff yeah yeah um yeah i'm glad that you are actually practicing as well um the i think the the minimum standards of universal design i know it's quite tricky especially working in a different industry right where it's not um always led by designers <laughs> um but i think it's it's definitely a start um anga i know working in a in a government <laughs> Um, how, how would you kind of push for inclusion or uh, maybe from your previous experiences as well? All right. Okay. So in, in, in my current work right now, right, like we're, we're building products, technology products for 50 million plus students, 7 million plus university students, 4 million plus teachers, where because we're part of the government institution, inclusion is sort of like becomes sort of like a standard, right? Or expectation, at least. Um, so when approaching inclusion, um, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm not super aware and I don't really know like the different frameworks out there, which is quite intentional because the goal is to make sure that our team are equipped with the mindset to approach inclusivity as opposed to be given like frameworks, right? Um, and this is really important because there are so many textures and colors in, in, in navigating inclusion that you cannot just use like a checklist, right? To, mm -hmm. uh, to say that, oh yes, we, we do inclusive design. Um, so this encompassing like, how do you shift your mindset from like the traditional design dogma of, you know, zero friction, uh, as little clicks as possible, which might not make sense for people who uh, don't have the confidence in, in their tech literacy, for example, right? So it's, it's really redefining the, the key design principles that we have in order uh, for us to be able to reach as many users as possible. Um, it's really redefining how we prioritize our um, uh, products um, or design decisions, so to say. Um, it, redefines how we approach uh, user research, for example, and the kind of questions that we ask uh, uh, to our users. Um, and all, it also redefines how we communicate with the different stakeholders as well, right? Um, so I guess in short, like the reason why I really want to focus on having inclusion more as a mindset than as a practice is because in reality, it's an extremely complex thing to do that no framework and checklist can, can address, you know, mm. but like if you have that mindset, then yeah, you might not know whether your inclusion strategy will be implemented or not, but it will also help you to be a better designer because if you can design for such complex, ambiguous use cases, right, then most of our projects, which is pretty clear, then it's going to be very easy uh, task to do. Um, so yeah, yeah. That, that's how I see it. Yeah. yeah. Really cool stuff. I mean, like, I think um, your perception on inclusion and you're designing with uh, people with different socioeconomic backgrounds. I think that gives a lot of um, different perspective on inclusion because when we see inclusion, we always see it from that uh, disability side, right? But we never see it also from an infrastructure perspective. Um, so maybe like my follow-up question to you would be like with the different socioeconomic backgrounds and like the different living conditions, um, how does that become your consideration in design? And how do you put inclusion into practice to consider these like living factors, socioeconomic um, backgrounds and differences? All right, okay. So um, I guess, first of all, um, understanding the different nuances first, right? So not assuming that we only have like one type of um, teachers, for example. Right. So it's really the understanding of different archetypes of teachers and how they um, in not only interact with our product, but it's like, how, how do they do their jobs to be done uh, through which our product try to address, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is um, 
at least in our experience, you cannot just be a digital product designer to address uh, inclusion um, um, uh, problems, right? A lot of the um, inclusion strategy, so to say, that we devise does not require technology. It's um, if like there are limit limitations to what technology can do. So um, there are parts where say, for example, if we're designing an experience for uh, users who are not um, with very limited accessibility in terms of um, you know internet connection and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't really make sense to provide like a lightweight technology products for them. It's better to think of a high touch mechanism, um, maybe not as at scale, uh, that can help them uh, emulate similar experience. Um, as the technology. So it's really about encouraging our, our, our designers to see their the problem that they're solving as part of a bigger ecosystem mm. and not just something that that a digital product can 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 solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, really good stuff. I think um yeah what you mentioned there is knowing the range of right the literacy or like the jobs to be done by the teachers, right? Knowing that range would help you guide um, designers to design kind of the different edge cases. And secondly, uh, moving away also from digital devices um, as kind of a potential solution, right? Not only limited to digital devices. Really good stuff. Um, Can yeah. I add something or like ask maybe something? As, yeah. Um, I because I really love what you said there around uh, like what I, I think a, a lot of things that you're saying they're kind of building up to this idea that um, you can't just uh, like take a framework and it's going to solve your problems for you um, and you you can't go and like generalize too much either because you can't like a general solution isn't really going to solve the problem either <laughs> I mean I, I kind of like both of those things that you're saying because it was it, it gets to to something like a, a strategy that I often use when I'm talking with people who seem to be struggling with like, why is this important How, or, or, or why, why can't I make this like use option A and I have to do option B or, or to find another option. Um, and it kind of comes back to the people. Like this isn't about some abstract standard. This isn't about some abstract, uh, you know, category of people. This is about a person or real people and being able to kind of put it in terms of those real people um, can help people to, it can help the designers um, or whoever else is involved here to um, empathize with it more. Obviously, uh, Aspia, I think you, you mentioned that bit kind of building empathy um, as well as just putting it in, in more concrete terms. Like this, is, this isn't some um, abstract problem we're trying to solve, this is real people. And if we don't know the answer, Let's go ask. Like, let's go find people that we can uh, we can talk to and observe and see. Like, what are your exact needs? Um, and recognizing that, like, you can maybe create an archetype, but there's going to be some people who are outside of that archetype. And being prepared for that and being ready to to examine that is really important. Mm -hmm. That was really mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's really insightful that it doesn't be, become something like a framework, right? It doesn't become something um, that you need a checklist at the end of the day. Um, Aspia, do you have any thoughts on that? Because again, in, in Grab, you'll probably be designing with different use cases as well. Um, what are your thoughts on approaching kind of that mindset approach framework or even going outside of digital? <laughs> outside of digital? Um, a bit difficult these days, as you can well aware. For the past two years, it's a bit difficult. But before we had a a large uh, group of people doing service design, figuring out different touch points, and then figuring out how does this touch point uh, play well with the experience mm -hmm. of the application. Um, overall, I agree. I agree in terms of how Anga has presented the information in terms of Southeast Asia, because I feel that we're not one type of of people where there's there's a lot of countries and there's a lot of diversities and how do you and different languages cultures mm, right. how do you bring all that back together framework does help it creates a, a a baseline for us to work off on if it's too large too wide everybody will say my country is important my culture is important and if you want to serve good at a larger scale how do you do that you need to consolidate 
what you can and then put it into some sort of framework to start with. Not saying that um, it's perfect, but I'm saying that it doesn't have to be just it. It doesn't have to be. That is the what way mm. we're doing. That's how we're going to do stuff going forward. There's always an ability to iterate, um, evolve. I think that's that's key, right? I think overall, as people, we we in Asia we have our own value system and we have our own interpretation. But I think the challenge is that we don't want to say those challenges, those limitations. And what we do all the time is read a lot from our Western counterparts because they have uh, a longer um, evolution period of this set of work. And mm. uh, that's where I think the, the folks here in this audience and this panel um, can help build that evolution uh, from a sterile, very abstract, very book-based, very best practice ways to always evolve that framework, right? We don't have to stand still. Stagnation is not the way to go forward. It's this richness of all these differences going back as some sort of feedback into that framework. That's, that's to me, is key. That's what makes a more <laughs> robust system rather right. than a system that is so sterile that if you mm -hmm. introduce something different, it will just mess everything up. So that's, that's what I think it is that you can't have to stir out of a framework. You need to be able to ever evolve. Maybe if I may, like I want to build on what Aspia mentioned. Like, um, yes, it's it's true. Of course, um, a, a framework will uh, serve as a, as a really good baseline, right? Yeah. But I think uh, one one um, one practice that we're trying to do now um, is. Um, Try to utilize framework not as a checklist, but as trigger questions. Mm. So um, it's not just like ticking the box, but like when you see a framework, it enables you to reflect and actually do sort of like higher order thinking kind of mechanism, you know. Um, so stuff like for every design decision that you make, for example, um, can you think of five unintended consequences to a different type of user segments, for example? And um, uh, what, uh, like, uh, how severe are, are those unintended consequences, right? Or the other uh, trigger question can be like, um, oh, um, how would an extreme user uh, use this experience? Are there any difference in how they do it? So it's really about, in Indonesia, it's beautiful, the word we call it pertanyaan pemantik, right? But it's essentially like trigger questions. Um, it, it, it really helped people to, um, uh, reflect on their decisions. And to be really honest, maybe I'm being a bit negative here. I feel that design has been so industrialized. Design practice has been so industrialized that that time and willingness to reflect, like we just almost don't have the luxury for that anymore, you know. But if you want to think about, if you want to do inclusive design, I don't think that there's any other way from really honing your reflective ability. Um, mm. That's 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 my, that's my, uh, I think it's great, right? Um, yeah. uh, sorry, just, just, just to jump in, I think this is really good. Um, not treating it as a checklist is very important. Um, I think I see a lot of that, especially in the corporate world. It is about the checklist. Right? Yeah. It, it is about the governance of the checklist <laughs> and the councils that goes through the checklist and goes like, this is it, this is it, this is it. But when you were mentioning it as a point of something to reflect upon, I think that's, that's, that's great, right? So we changed this checklist into a reflective uh, checklist with points that kind of like sub points that sits underneath it. Um, but that will also kind of like require a certain level of maturity. And yes. in order for us to reach it, I think we just need to con continuously launch and learn, right? And, and keep on evolving. Um, the key, key word that you just mentioned as well was that design being industrialized, I agree we are machines, to be honest, right? You send it to a team, we process, we come up with good stuff, good stuff, and then we launch it and we get awards and we're happy. Um, but I think this conversation itself is gonna help bring us to this uh, empathical point where we started from so that we can kind of like really think through what we're doing, whether it's correct or, or not. I guess I will, to, to simplify that, it's more of like, I totally agree. No, there's no such thing as a checklist to, to help us move forward. Uh, totally agree that needs to bring back to um, the, the root of empathy. 
I think those are the two things that I kind of like want to echo. No, yeah, I think these are good items. I think um, the checklist would kind of uh, become that reflection question thing. Like I, if you keep a journal, you'll look into the journal, you'll reflect back on these things, right? And you'll practice it so often that it becomes so embedded in what you do on your day-to-day -day practice that it becomes just normal, right? <laughs> And you kind of autopilot from that. So I think it's a good way to see it. And I, th I think as design practitioners as well, um, uh, we, we don't want to be perceived as machines, right? We want to move away that we are just treated as machines day in, day out, produce, produce, produce. But we want to be uh, more critical about the things that we are approaching, the problems that we are solving. Um, I guess like also uh, in light of this, because we are from different countries, right? Um, what would be the different or unique behaviors that you see could be an interesting um, angle for inclusion? Like, for example, language could be one, right? Um, it could, like, for uh, is one in Malaysia, language probably is not only Malay, it's probably there's Hindi, there's Chinese. Um, are there any other, like, unique behaviors that you see in your home country that you think is worth addressing? Um, yeah, to, to be honest, I think even just, uh, you know, the so majority of Malaysians speak Bahasa, right? Bahasa Malaysia. Um, and then the next one is English. And then mm. uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Hindi, and Tamil and stuff. Uh, Tamil and Hindi, and then uh, Telugu. And so, so you have that kind of long tail of languages. Yeah. Right? Um, but it's also different when you're from the Semenanjung, which is the peninsula of Malaysia, and then uh, Borneo, which is the east side of Malaysia, where the dialect uh, starts to change uh, drastically, right? Even just in, in the peninsula itself, from the city uh, all the way to the north and south, it starts to change uh, drastically. But when you move to the east, it's just totally different. Um, like um, the term kami, kami is us. In, in, in peninsula, right? But mostly in, uh, in East is me, it's I. So that one word itself has two different um, uh, way of using it. And, and it's, um, it, it's, it's a big um, kind of confusion sometimes, right? So with that itself, I think it's just to really for us to identify um, what would be that common Bahasa language to use in terms of uh, in education. Um, in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in news writing, right, in journalism uh, and so forth. So with that, then we can kind of like bring it to a base and then kind of build from there. And, and I'm talking more towards of, uh, the language of communication more than anything else. I think that's the top of my mind that I can think of right now. Right, right. Does that translate to any of the products that you're designing as well? Like um, being able to meet or to consider it all these dialects or do you just usually go to English? Yeah, default English, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> there's, there's no other way. I mean, like, um, especially with, with the products that we have, um, it's not just, it, we're a regional bank, right? Um, so um, we, we start off with English first as the main language um, that then covers out most of the, 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 the countries that, that we're in. Um, and then from there on, then based on, let's say, if it's Thailand, then we'll switch to Thai. Right? If it's Indonesian, then we'll switch to Bas Indonesia, because those are the strong languages within those countries. But by default, our, our method of communication is in English. Right. Right. Um, maybe some thoughts from Aspia as well um, on language, because I know that you deal with a lot of content writers and content designers. Um, for this, um, what is your approach when you think about language? Um, what am I? Not really my approach because it's not my practice, but you are right. Uh, past uh, experiences working in an engineering team for six years requires me to understand about different uh, methods of uh, transmitting the message, right? Uh, in a web platform and now in this company in a microcopy platform. Uh, this, the the thing though is that um, in, the, in the company I'm in right now, we are really like trying to rejig everything in a way from, um, from a platform perspective and also from a language cultural perspective. 
because uh, the challenges with from web to mobile experiences is that you only have smaller real estate to translate yeah. that message. Yes. So I had people come to me in tears, in tears because they don't understand the language, they don't understand the cultural nuances. Um, mm -hmm. And bottom, it can go to the point whereby even writing a message in our own language, in the local language, is such a contradiction because within that language also, we have the formal language and we have the informal language. And uh, where are you as a person who's trying to create standard, make a call on that? Do you include the English, Taglish, Singlish, whatever ish? <laughs> or do you just exclude it? Because now we, we go to the realm of inclusion, right? Bottom line is this, the, the, the idea is do the UX thing, user experiencing. Or give me, I have children in the background. The, um, we love children. Yeah, we love them. We love them. <laughs> the, the thing is, is that, um, so from a user experience perspective, we should take that in consideration what translate and what relates the message. If your business can do it and will do it, yeah, yay for us, it's easier. But if not, you have to find a way that, that compromise because what was done in the past does not mean it is what the present users, the present people understand what you're trying to relay. And if that message can't be relayed properly, it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Like Anga cited about different social economics and the nuances of diversity. It really does play impact when we're trying to be a super app and try to see from the perspective of everybody. This is too wide. So we have to really work on categorizing, defining, and figuring out what works for them for each set of users. Maybe it's not a great idea because what we're doing is organizing and compartmentalizing, and therefore it, it's a bit siloed, but it's mm -hmm. it's trying to. I shall not use the elephant analogy, but we're trying to solve the problem and looking at the problem in bite sizes first, but yeah. not forgetting what the first principles is, is to enable the users, right? To understand, to do, to action, to solve their problems. I think if you go from that perspective, you, you're not going too far, too wrong. But overall, right, we should think in consideration what gets the job done in relaying that message or getting them to understand it at a more universal level. Yes. Uh, if you come back to the design perspective or trying to create an iconography, a pictogram can have so much differences in terms of nuances. I remember at one point in time, I had a colleague in, in the old company uh, talking about visual design iconography specifically. She said, what represents takeaway? Well, in my mind, there are so many different things. He showcased um, a takeaway box which is a very American thing. It's not an Asian thing. I say, hey, this one don't pass on idea. I cannot, cannot. <laughs> so that is one, one area whereby mm. having the diversity in your company uh, able to put in a process in place and also figure out, hey, what was the research coming in telling us about this and that? Um, it's not a small job in trying to figure out what does the job best in relaying that message. It's not. So I think uh, whoever is facing all this day to day, trying to make that decision, give yourselves a pat on the back because as I said, it's not something easy, but it's something to me, a sense of purpose in trying to figure out what's the best way to communicate with our, our people, right? I don't right. like what user, but how, what's the best way do we communicate back to our people? Because I think, as people who are creating experiences, whether in design or engineering research or yada yada, that's where the connection of everyone should be in this together in opposed to um, trying to figure out hey, what's best yeah. for me and my people. That's exactly the opposite of inclusion. Yeah. Should be yeah, able to super. include everybody in trying to relay that message across. Yeah, right on, right on. Um, I think that's super uh, interesting. Um, because as a background, Jeff, uh, obviously we have a lot of dialects in Southeast Asia, a lot of informal and formal languages as well. Um, so the approach is quite interesting. Um, any, any thoughts on that and translating languages um, from your end? 
Yeah, so I, I certainly can't speak to the, the specific lang language diversity because uh, <laughs> it's not something I've experienced directly. Uh, but I think that uh, everything that I just heard is, is feels like it's really in the right direction. I think um, uh, kind of coming back to those those frameworks and, and using them to to uh, pose questions and 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 force some kind of higher level thinking. Uh, I I think the the way I might approach that is um, to try to identify who is excluded um, by a certain way of communicating, uh, and try to really pinpoint who specifically is included. Not necessarily a generic group of people, but who specifically is excluded by communicating in a certain way, uh, and then also examining kind of how are they coping today? Um, how do they how do they deal with that? today? Are they just excluded and that's the end of it? Or have they found a way to manage somehow to be, to still participate, to still uh, communicate, even though there's a barrier um, that, that is excluding them? So uh, then by, uh, by exploring that, you're able to identify, well, is there something about the way that they're communicating or that they're coping um, with this exclusion uh, that we could, that we could, um, do something about we can magnify that can we can we formalize that can we build a, a product around that could we change could we use that coping mechanism that they have to change the way that we that we communicate in the first place um and it could be that uh that means changing the format that you communicate in um i know that uh spoken language can be uh, understood and and used very differently than written language, and you can do different things with written language than you might be able to do with spoken language. Um, so if it's like um, putting it into a format that is more easily uh, translated, like auto translators, or yeah. if there needs to be human translation, how do we how do we uh, facilitate that in a more natural way? Um, those are things that I would expect to be able to kind of learn more about by by finding those specific people who are excluded and, and trying to understand um, what exactly is it that's causing them to be excluded and how are they maybe already coping with that that I could learn from. Yeah, super. Um, we are running a bit over time. Um, we have a few questions from the audience as well, um, which I think are related to some of the questions that I have. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, how does the inclusive and accessible design translate into business decisions? And how do you balance the additional cost of it? And since Southeast Asia, in, for Southeast Asia, inclusive design is a new thing, how do you convince stakeholders um, of inclusive and accessible design to be applied in every product? So I guess, I don't know, who's up for that question maybe? Not me. Um, <laughs> we don't have business motive here. Yeah, <laughs> just all doing it. Yeah. I think I can take a stab at this one, right? Um, how do we kind of convince our stakeholders? One, I would say it's just to ninja the whole thing in um, and then do a case study after that. <laughs> <laughs> because to be honest, when you're going to talk to the business and say, hey, look, you know, we have to spend X amount of time to fix the colors. They're going to go like, what does that mean? Uh, what's the ROI in this? Um, is there any uplift? Um, you know, uh, what percentage are we looking at? 10, 5% increase? Um, are we going to cover more people and stuff like that? And to be honest, I don't think any of us can answer that uh, to a certain right. extent, right? It's more of like, okay, let's let's take this um, work, uh, add it onto it, um, ninja this in, and then at the end of it, turn it into a case study and say, hey, we found that by doing this this way, we see an, an increase here, a decrease of time spent here, and also um, a more, um, uh, let's say, uplift in productivity because we have now an X amount of uh, colors to choose from instead of a whole plethora of canvas for for designer slash artist to decide on that day itself what color the button should be, right? Um, so that's that's one way. Another part is that I think um, Jeff kind of mentioned it earlier, which is to find an ally, a senior ally, right? And you know, you might be a junior in in this uh, in this company. Find a senior that really has interest. I don't think this person will fully believe in it, but has some form of interest. 
and then and then work together with him or her, right? And and that way to kind of like get that idea across. Now, this is a choice that you would have to make, whether you want to be the center of attention or you want the solution to be the center of attention, right? So that is it's up to you, like um, our audience, dear audience. <laughs> um, most will kind of like go like, hey, but this is my idea. I want it to be heard and so forth. And most go, will go like, it is there. We're doing the good thing for our people and, and, and we should continue doing this. Uh, that's my take on that question. Cool, cool. Um, Jeff, do you want to respond to some of that? Uh, no, I think the like ninjaing it in is definitely, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's definitely going to be the, the main way that most folks can, can do this because finding those senior level champions can be pretty hard, um, but, but also a very good route. Um, so and the way to, that you might be able to identify those, those high level, those executive level champions or the, the senior level champions um, or allies is uh, finding ways to, to like uh, socialize the idea that there might be an opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. um, it could be if it could be uh, finding a way to, to tell a story in a fairly public way um, or, you know, public being within your organization. Um, like a, at, at LinkedIn, we have uh, like company all hands kind of meetings uh, mm -hmm. very frequently. And those often have a, a space for employees to be able to come and, and tell some kind of a story. Um, and so if you can find a way to uh, tell, tell some kind of a narrative that might spark allies, uh, yeah. in, especially in the executive leaders that tend to run those kinds of meetings, um, that can be really powerful. It might come through like a hackathon too. If you have uh, any kind of venue in your organization or time when people have license to just try things um, like, like a, hack, a hackathon or if there's some kind of a, an innovation center within your company. Um, the, the value prop for inclusive design isn't so much um, the reducing costs or trying to avoid lawsuits. It's about new opportunity. It's mm -hmm. about like using these constraints of, uh, of an excluded or marginalized group to identify brand new opportunities that the business has never even considered before and that the whole industry has never considered before. Yeah. Uh, so I think if you can find those, uh, those innovation centers, if you have those kind of R&D groups within your organizations, um, whatever scope they, they have, um, whether it's like a permanent innovation or R&D kind of center or a hackathon, a hack day sort of thing, um, take advantage of those and, and try to see what you can do in the space of those. Um, and if not, yeah, uh, ninja, I really love that term. <laughs> and then measure it. Uh, it. When you ninja, you need to measure it and like tell that case study afterwards. Don't just do it and then see the metrics go off or whatever, no. <laughs> After that case study and talk about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, talking about it is important. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Um, I just wanna add, um, mm -hmm. Aside from just looking at from your product development leaders, you should also take a look at how the company is addressing inclusion. And is there any inclusion champions within the company? Human resource should have, uh, and it's not about inclusive design being new, it's more of it's been around for quite some time. It has yeah. been around since the World Wide Web standards has been established for the digital space. But before that, uh, like Jeff mentioned, uh, how people are creating audio books for the um, people with limitations. It's already been there. It's the question of um, as organization is getting more public, um, more uh, what do you call spotlighted through social media. What mm -hmm. is our social responsibilities, corporate social responsibilities platform, corporate social responsibilities initiative? Is there a way for design to play a part in that? You can, I believe there should be under the company culture uh, workplace uh, improvement programs. I think you should think about how that um, partner with those kind of non-product development team kind of uh, allies in opposed to just looking at it, this is a design problem. It's not a, just a design problem. It's a problem for all of us because as our population ages, as our population decreases in numbers, uh, there will be a time you need to address how can we be able to better uh, get our stuff done day to day. Um, I think um, some people have written about it quite extensively that we don't really design for things for the age population and that's kind of a, mm -hmm. a challenge there mm -hmm. because we're going to get there one day so mm -hmm. i think companies are well aware they need to do some sort of responsibility towards what they're gaining right as yeah. well how do they give back 
if there's a way to do that from design, great. If there's ways to do it with multiple partners aside from design, let's do that yeah. first and then build that, build that campaign, yeah. build that yeah. awareness. Yeah, that's really good stuff um, on the company level side, which actually leads me to my next question from the audience. Um, she's curious, he or she, is curious to hear more from the Southeast Asian panelists on the state of awareness of inclusive design effort in Southeast Asia, whether it's within or outside your organizations. Where do, we th where do you think we are in the maturity level that Jeff shared earlier? Maybe I can start, right? Like, um, again, I feel that inclusive design is such a big term and it's like, Personally, I feel that um, the level of inclusivity is different depending on what sort of like different groups you are targeting, right? Um, but if we take a step back, I feel that if you want to look at the state of inclusive design, we first have to look at the state of inclusivity as a social discourse uh, in the nation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, Inclusive design can only be as good or as bad as how uh, how inclu uh, how inclusion is being part of a of, you know like day to day social cultural discourse in in, in the country. Um, yeah. That doesn't really answer the uh, question I know, but I, I I think it's important to 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 see that on, on that perspective first. Now, I feel that what makes it more challenging in Southeast Asia to truly think about inclusion is one of course the diversity, but like. I think the impact of the diversity is the fact that, again, like who, who do you want to include? You know, like they, they, it's so diverse that you just cannot start. Like when you think about homogeneous society, like in Scandinavia, for example, they can start to talk about like aging population, climate change and everything, which is great. And I, 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 I really respect it, but it's like in a heterogeneous community, like in Southeast Asia, like how do you even start talking about inclusivity? So maybe that's the first thing that needs to be addressed first, like what, whatever area of you know inclusion interest that uh, inclusion that you are interested in, then you know raise the awareness and try to talk more about it, and then you move to the design part, right? And I think the other thing that makes it a bit challenging is the fact that in most Southeast Asian nation, I'm sorry if I'm assuming here, or at least in Indonesia, it's diverse, but it's very groupthink, right? It mm -hmm. has very strong groupthink tendency, so despite the diversity, you surround yourself with people who think pretty much the same way as you are, which ex uh, exclude your mind, a, a point of view from, from other groups. And that's why I feel that like inclusivity is not, the lack of inclusivity in Southeast Asia is probably not, not due to malicious intent, it's just lack of awareness because yeah. of the complexity of dealing with diversity as well as uh, the group thing tendency of you know, like majority of Southeast Asian culture. Yeah, I know that I'm a bit abstract here. So maybe like the rest can, can give like a more tangible example. I, I pass one on that. I think the, the challenge is, is that we, we, we kind of like have this idea inclusiveness is this far reaching brand new area of work that it's not, it's, it's been around as long as we all been around, right? So the question is, you can't answer it by making a blanketed um, or a sterile or anything that another term which I don't really like but I don't have a better term cookie cutter approach to it you can't you have to take you have to like think a lot about um, if you want to do a greater good for ABC reason uh, would you consider every single individual or would you try to start with the biggest population or biggest numbers of way of working first and then build back on um, considering who's included and who's excluded and then figuring out how to like do it. I think certain companies are already having those, a lot of these programs about inclusion because it is quite relevant now, especially when we talk about inclusion, we're talking about mental health and mental well being. Have we considered that? How do we remove anxiety, remove uh, not being stressed yeah. at, to a point where you can't do your job? That is also part of inclusion, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the inclusion part is also what they're saying is what I'm hearing in terms of numbers. 70% of it is invisible. It's not as I, I have this divisibly and it's visible to you. Inclusion also covers what is not seen. So I think overall, in state that you're trying to define, 
I would try to understand, are you referring to something of a UX maturity phases and stages? Are you referring to certain companies that has those different set of inclusion and uh, success stories? It's, it's too wide to just fit it in Asia, in Southeast Asia. I think we should start looking at how do we define, how do we actually even frame that in our own teams, in our own company, in our own country, in our own societies right now, um, before trying to say we're not at this stage, we're not at that stage. It's, it's not about stages. The question now, is there awareness and is there ongoing activities to promote that inclusion? And it starts from you as well. It starts from us as well. It's not just, oh, it's a company problem, it's the government's problem. It's not, it's everybody's problem. My question is, how are we working at it day to day? Yeah, that's, go on, Isabel. Yeah, no, I was, I was thinking um, uh, when I was talking about it, uh, instead of like maturity stages, right? I mean, like you have your UX maturity, everything, it's, it's like a step. But to be honest, it's not a step. It's more like a, like a bar that progresses, right? Um, if you kind of um, put the theme together, whether it's like say social economic discourse, how well are we versed uh, in this topic? You know, then th there's a bit of a bar that goes up. Uh, in terms of, um, let's say, physical disabilities or challenges, you know, where in, in the organization are we there? You know, are we at uh, 10, 20%, 30%, 50%? And then inclusiveness of workplace, right? And where are we there? And, and I think with that itself, then it's more of like, how holistic are we approaching this rather than where are we in terms of like the, the, the steps to heaven um, that, that we, we are at right now, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I would say it's like, it's more of like, are we moving in the right direction? Are yeah. we concentrating, because of this organization that we're in, are we concentrating more on physical disabilities? Are we concentrating more on mental and health challenges? Are we concentrating more? And that itself will kind of like shape this, um, you know, this thing. I, I have no word for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel that we also forget we have lots of value. We have rich value system in Asia. We have Yes, a tendency to be collective. We want to be in a majority yeah. than a minority. I know we do that. But it doesn't mean with that, that's, that's, there's no inability for you to speak and then change that conversation. Even at a little bit, you're doing that part because you're feeling strongly about it, right? It's not saying that you can't do it. If it's a collective kind of uh, value system, way of working, day-to-day -day kind of thing that we are at, then use that in a way to like push your conversation towards inclusion. I think it's, 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 that is important that we, we acknowledge there's that area of work that needs to be done and we continue that good work. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, we are out of time, but if you guys have uh, another 20 minutes, I guess in the session, we can keep the conversation going. Um, I'll just ask a few more questions from the audience. Is that okay? Good for me. Yeah, good for me. Cool. Um, okay, so there's uh, there's one question for Jeff. So uh, so Jeff, there's a question from Rahma, who is one of our uh, ally partners. Uh, they have been ac actively championing ally in Indonesia, and she talked to some of the LinkedIn employees here, and they are not as aware about uh, ally accessibility features in their platform. So she's wondering about what are your thoughts in championing, championing this within the organization in Southeast Asia? That's a great question. So if these are LinkedIn employees in Southeast Asia, then um, there are a number of ways that internally we talk about this. Um, and we have employee resource groups that are open to everyone. Um, it should, those should be available um, to the uh, there's, there's a whole um, uh, ERG, employee resource group for mm -hmm. accessibility or, or uh, disability specifically um, that we use for um, both making sure we've got that representation in the workplace, um, as well as a way to have this kind of dialogue um, about what we're doing in our products as well as, and, and what we're doing in our workplace. Um, so I, uh, th th that's one area. Um, where we try to do outreach, we try to make sure people are aware of the fact that those employee resource groups exist. Uh, but then we also rely on 
um, the the kind of like uh, company all hands that I mentioned or products product group specific um, communications to make sure that we have a presence in those to talk about um, maybe specific features that we're rolling out um, and what kinds of resources are available to employees with disabilities. Um, and uh, as, as well as larger initiatives that we're doing, like what kinds of programs are we running internally to try to maybe change the way that we approach accessibility and inclusive design. Um, and those would appear in those kinds of like uh, internal company, all hands uh, or product or, or group specific sort of comms um, that go out. But we try to be, be very multi-channel about it. Um, it doesn't mean that we reach everybody. Obviously, it sounds like there's a group of people that we could reach out to um, differently and reach. Um, and this is maybe a question that I'll bring back to the group that I work with is like, hey, it sounds like there's there's a whole group of people that we're not reaching. Um, so how do we talk with this group of people and um, and and what what's what's the gap there? Um, but yeah, so like we we try to be very multi-channel about it. We try to we try to hit like the very big overarching kind of uh, communication channels that we have. Um, we also have more specific like targeted groups that that we work with as well. Um, I don't know. Did that answer the question? Yeah. I wonder. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think <laughs> it does. Um, I think it's difficult as well with a bigger organization, right? Especially with something that is more global, having to have different. Um, I mean, obviously comms would go uh, to different countries, but if we have to cater for certain comms to be framed a certain way, that also needs to be brought up, right? I mean, like, um, good thing that Rama brought it up so that you are aware of it as well um, in a way we can yeah. try to... And I'll look forward to, to unpacking that and try to figure out like what, uh, which groups are those um, and how can we reach them better? Uh, I know that most of the work that I do is within the design organization, which is within our, our R&D group. Um, and we have designers in, yeah, in India and we have designers in China. Um, that's that's our, our presence in Southeast Asia um, for designers specifically. Um, but what I've, I encounter all sorts of challenges when it comes to like just the time zone barrier. Mm. Um, if I'm trying to lead a workshop or if I'm trying to run a seminar um, or, or answer questions, even just fielding questions in like an office hours sort of environment. Um, it's that that time zone barrier is a real challenge. Um, and so one of the ways that I work around that is by being very flexible with my time um, and making sure that our teams in, in Bangalore or in Beijing, if they have a question, um, they know that they can ask me at any time. And I'll say, okay, you know what? I, I don't mind hopping on a call at 8 p.m. my time or 10 p.m. my time, if it means that I can answer a question, help somebody get unstuck there um, on some problem that they're working on. And so being really um, clear about that and establishing the relationships where they know they don't have to, uh, they don't have to hesitate. There, there should be no hesitation. If they need help um, or if they wanna talk about something, they know they can reach out. Um, and that, that helps a lot. That requires relationship building. And sometimes that's hard to do at scale for a you know LinkedIn seventeen thousand people globally, so developing that kind of trust and that relationship uh, yeah. is is difficult to scale for sure. <laughs> I haven't no. found the the magical way to do that quite yet. Of course, of course, there's uh, there it takes time to move people, <laughs> so we all know that. So it it might just need some time nurturing some more people and grooming people, and that's what it takes. Um, we have another question for everyone in the panel group. Um, how does accessibility or inclusive, uh, inclusive work for kids? So um, I guess the question is, what would be the design opportunities or design initiatives for kids? And as we know, kids and adults have different behavior while using digital products. What would be your approach to that? I feel like this is a, a natural place to talk about education. <laughs> um, kids, kids in education uh, have a strong intersect. So Anga, it sounds like it sounds like you work in education. Is, is this <laughs> your wheelhouse? <laughs> I don't know. I mean uh, it's uh, it's quite of a vague question because it's like how do you design for adults? Like um, it, it really depends on the context. Uh, of course um, 
I think the most important thing is whatever we do in designing for uh, kids um, is just to make sure that we are really aware of all the unintended consequences to it, especially when we're talking about technology, right? Um, when we're talking about user experience, I'm a firm believer that kids actually are a much better, um, you know, tech, much more tech literate than, than, than we are. So in a lot of ways, it's probably easier from, uh, from product, you know, feature perspective to, to design for kids. Um, but I, 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 I guess like that's, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, I feel that, um, so say for example, that's one of the reason why um, the work that we do now almost, there's very few, if nothing at all, products that we design directly targeted to um, uh, students, like lower level students, right? Like elementary school, for example, or junior high. Um, and that's really because we want to be very mindful of, um, you know, the implications to uh, designing, for, uh, designing for kids. And until we actually know sort of like the best practice and really how to do it, like we, we prefer to sort of like withdraw from it. Um, one thing that is actually quite interesting that we're exploring right now is while a lot of our products, the end beneficiaries are kids, right? But we use um, parents, uh, teachers as, as a conduit. So we actually designed the product for the teachers, for the parents, for example, um, to, uh, yeah, uh, to improve their, their relationship with the kids, for example. Um, that's, that's sort of like a, a, a direction that we, we, much, we are much preferred to take. Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna stop there first, yeah. I think I'm gonna add in a bit, right? Because um, in my previous life, I was doing a bit of research for the um, um, year three and below in Malaysia for their pedagogy and, and the way that they learn in classroom and stuff like that. And interesting enough, I would say that design thinking is one of the best ways for us to get information out of kids. Like it is the best way because it's open-ended and then they can interpret it how they want and giving like a pen to paper they'll just come up with all these crazy ideas and crazy information and stuff where you go like, wow, this kid, you know, when you're having a one-on-one -on -one interview, they don't want to talk to you. Yeah. And you put a pen and paper and then go like, hey, can you draw this? Draw your experience. And they'll just draw a whole story. And then they will tell you why the coconut tree is on the right side of the page and not on the left side of the page, right? Because that is where I come from, from the house. And I will pass through this coconut tree to go to school. And then when I arrive in school, um, the, the stigma here is that uh, just, just a bit of, a, of the problem statement is the, uh, the Orang Asli, which is the, uh, the indigenous people um, are seem to be lazy at school, right? So we want to get at the bottom of it to try and understand like, what do you mean by lazy? What is your definition of lazy? And we found out that they're not lazy. They just don't have the energy. They come to school like two, three hours, sometimes half and like you know, some crazy hours to travel from one part Oh, of, wow. of the state to the school and once they reach there they're out of energy they're like i don't have money for food right and and, and i need to carry these books and um it's it's hot sun or i don't want to get my shoes dirty because i'll get you know um, um penalized by the school system so i have to carry the shoes in the bag and walk through but they didn't want to talk about it when you ask like straight dead into their face they don't want to talk about it but when you give access a different way to communicate I, again, I, I just straight away to answer that question, if you can apply design thinking, please do. I think that's the best way to get information out of kids. I, I think I wanna build up on what Iswan mentioned earlier. So like what I said earlier, like despite not, you know, designing product for kids, but we always make sure that we involve kids in our research and inspiration seeking. Um, I think the, 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 the main principle is don't, um, don't let the adults decide what uh, should be designed for the kids, you know, then you should talk to them. Um, although your product might not be directly um, used by uh, kids, uh, but it's still very important to involve them in the, in the discovery phase, at least, yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of connecting that back to what you had said earlier, that like, uh, you, I, I totally agree. Like you, if your kids are gonna be your users, you should be designing with, your, with the kids. 
Um, the kids are not the decision makers about whether to use that thing though often. So like uh, connecting back to their, your comment you made earlier around like what could go wrong here. Um, often that's how the parents are thinking about it. It's like, what could go wrong if my child uses this product? Am I gonna allow my child to use this thing? Um, but I love the the design thinking approach here because I, like when I've, I have a, a six-year-old son um, and one of the things I love about having a six-year-old son is the way that he thinks is just completely different. Like uh, no filters doesn't have a, like a lot of the concepts of social stigmas around things. Um, and so you, you can ask a question and maybe he won't know how to answer it. But if you ask it the right way, he'll tell you just completely unfiltered and often in very creative ways, uh, what it is like how he sees the world, how he interprets things and what his desires are and his dreams and, those, and like what's working for him, what's not. Um, but totally, if you ask him just point blank, like, uh, what do you, like, what do you like about this? He won't really know. He won't know what to say. And uh, I think that's a really the powerful thing. Um, so not having any filters, but also not necessarily knowing, knowing how to articulate things. That's kind of characteristic of kids. I don't know whether this helps, but, uh, I think UT is important and I don't have experience in education. I have lots of children who are not mine. Uh, I have baby nephews and nieces right now at the same household. And But what struck my mind was all these technologies that's in their hands right now because parents want to eat, so they kind of like gave them technology. Don't know whether that's a good idea. But the assumption that kids are uh, limited in certain ways of understanding how to navigate things, it kind of blew my mind. The kid was less than, um, I think he was less than, he's less than two. And you know that child lock thing whereby mm -hmm. you have that, click and it goes all the way to the end then it unlocks you know you think babies can't figure that out I literally saw him boop, click on the button hold it out boop, opens it up unlock the child lock so I'm like thinking all those users designers who say oh that thing kids at a certain age group won't be able to unlock it that kind of blew my mind nope you didn't figure this generation of babies because he literally was a baby right and that piece of feature is throughout all these programs for kids. And I'm thinking, hmm, we don't know a lot about how these kids are thinking and navigating things these days. So I just want to highlight that feature. It's stop child lock or child proof. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's I think it'll be super fun to get like a couple of kids for a focus group discussion and just like, you know, brainstorm and like tell us what your story is, you know, and it'll be super interesting. Actually, think if I may add a bit. This is this is jumping a bit, but like uh, mm -hmm. based on what Aspia mentioned earlier, it just got me thinking that um, there's actually the dark a dark side of uh, inclusive yes. design. You know, like when you try to design for you know groups that you might not not necessarily truly understand their life context, right? They, uh, it, it could be you know pretty dangerous, so to say. We see it with kids and their relationship with technology. We see, especially in Indonesia, the emergence of financial inclusion uh, uh, products that is aimed to democratize uh, uh, finance access to everyone, but without proper financial literacy and financial maturity, then they actually end up using it for, for uh, use cases that in the long run uh, disadvantage them instead of um, providing them with, with benefits, right? So I think this is also something that we really need to think about when we talk about inclusive design. Um, it's not, you know, it's not always flowers and rainbow, you know, like if you really don't understand the true life context of the users and how they could potentially use your product for different use cases, right? And Southeast Asia is very hacky. Um, maybe yeah. as you know, of course, like the number of fraud and, um, you know, hacky, uh, you know, users in Grab, right? Uh, it's the same because I used to work in Gojek as well. And it's the same, which, which is interesting because it's so hacky, but like, yeah, um, I guess we always have to keep that in mind that good intention does not necessarily always result in, you know, good outcome. Yeah. Right. There's a, an expression that gets used in uh, accessibility worlds quite a lot, which which I think I've heard this in in a lot of different uh, in a lot of other um, domains as well, like race and ethnicity inclusion, where uh, the expression is uh, nothing for us without us. 
Like don't, don't design for people with disabilities, design with people with disabilities. Don't design for kids, design with kids. Because to your point, if you don't really understand uh, the implications of what your design decisions are, are uh, you might end up doing more harm than good, um, no matter how good your intentions are. So that's a, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, knowing the the consequences in the end um, would definitely help us understand even more. Um, I wanted to read out this um, comment that Aswin kind of read out, which was quite relevant when we were talking about the kids part. So this topic reminds me of the time that I worked in Ruanguru, an education tech in Indonesia, to test the learning video contents and the UX flow on an app for K-12 students. Most of the kids showed and react through their body language first prior to communicating with words. So that's quite interesting as well, uh, knowing from kids. Um, and our last question for today, before I close this out, is um, mostly on co-designing as well and also research and usability testing. This is from Fita, actually, my, one of my friends. Um, how do you guys include uh, people with disabilities in research or usability testing? So anything co-design related, how would you include them and what would your approach be? I can talk about a couple of different ways that we've, we've done this at LinkedIn. Um, and we're still really early on our journey here. Like we, we haven't uh, perfected this and we didn't operate at a scale with this, but, um, but there are a few things that I think have worked really well. And one of those is um, figuring out what ways of, of user research, what kind of user research um, works well for kind of what you're equipped to do. Um, so I mentioned before, like a, a lot of the, the prototyping tools that are out there are just absolutely hands down not accessible for a lot of different kinds of disability. So if you're gonna, if, if you, if you wanna get user research, uh, if you want to perform user research and get that, that co-design input from people with disabilities on something that's not in production yet, uh, you, you might not be able to do the research the way that you are used to, where you just put together a Figma prototype and throw it up on the screen and say, hey, can you click around? Because the person might not be able to click around. Um, uh, it, so thinking of like, how am I going to do this differently? Is it uh, like, what, what, how can I create an equivalent experience that I can test? Or is there some other way that I can get the insights that I need that don't involve using a prototype? Um, is there some way that I could learn about the needs of this user or how they behave with technology, um, how they operate in this job to be done, so to speak, um, that doesn't involve using a prototype. Could I have them use the live product? Could I, could I observe them maybe off of my platform entirely and just kind of see how they're using uh, technology and how they think about technology? Um, that's, I think that's really important. And then the next one is um, where are you like getting your uh, participants from? That can be a real challenge, especially if uh, I mentioned uh, like, Disability is, is very stigmatized in most of the world, actually, still, and including the United States and the UK, these places that maybe have a little bit less stigma, it's still very stigmatized and there's a lot of discrimination. Um, so finding participants who, who, are, are, who you know have a disability can be a real challenge because, uh, one, it's probably illegal to track that information without consent. And two, even if you can track it, people are very sensitive to it and they're, they're very hesitant to volunteer that information. Um, so the, the way that one way that can be really successful in finding participants for your, for your research is to find local organizations that represent those communities of people with disabilities. So finding the local community of, of people who are blind or have vision loss um, that work with those people to help them navigate their daily lives or connect them with opportunity or jobs or places to live. Um, those kinds of places can be really great places to partner with for saying like, hey, I, I need help yeah. understanding how uh, a blind person might use technology. Can, can you connect me with some people in your community to, um, to perform some studies? Um, forming those kinds of partnerships can be really helpful for, um, for research as well. So yeah. I'll stop there. Those are some things that I've seen work really well. Cool. Actually, um, I have a follow-up question for you, uh, Jeff. So. Um, 
one um, one technique that so far we think works quite well, but I don't know whether this is relevant for all sort of like use cases is we always try not to separate the uh, different able people and our mainstream users in a co-design. So it's not like we're having, you know, one one group with, you know, people with certain disabil disabilities and the other group full of, full of our mainstream users. We always try to mix them because oftentimes it's, you get the nuggets of insights and you, you understand the texture through observing the interaction between them, um, right? Um, so that's, uh, we, we've done that several times. It is much more difficult to do it because then, you know, like you cannot just easily put things on post-it notes and stuff like that. Um, but the, the gain is usually worth it because you, you would get additional insights that you wouldn't get otherwise, you know, yeah. But do you, uh, Jeff, do you see that as a as a as a technique that can be relevant in all use cases, or it's only you know? Yeah, yeah. I think if you can if you can anticipate um, the barriers and 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 make sure that you've got the right systems in place to to remove those barriers, um, then that's then that works out great. Um, and sometimes that can be that can have the kind of the added bonus of of whoever's facilitating that. Uh, that experience um, has to be that much more aware of the fact that they have a mix of people who can see and who can't see, and people who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing, and people who are not deaf and hard of hearing. And like, there's just a mix of ability, um, and so the person who's facilitating, or, or really everyone in the room, has to have this raised awareness of the fact that um, that they're interacting with people who have different abilities than they do. And um, I, I, I imagine that that could bias some of the outcome, just that raised level of awareness could prime people to think a certain way. Um, but I don't, I don't know that that would be the case. Um, so this is, that's just kind of a, an idea that popped in my head. There might be um, some bias that that introduces, but the benefit probably outweighs that bias in, in most co-designing um, scenarios. But I like the idea. I don't have a lot of direct experience for that kind of co-designing with a, with a mix of ability and uh, disability to be able to speak directly to it. So I'm largely speculating here. I'm really intrigued. I'm thinking that it could be some form of like triangulation, right? Because that's just one way of, of getting information. And then there's another way of like having a conversation with them. And another part is actually, for me, I, I think that works well is like, like journal studies. Um, where we get them to kind of like document, you know, set a time period of, of their lives, how they interact with certain things and so forth, with photos, with voice notes, with videos and so forth. And then that will be another point of triangulation that we kind of, kind of build this 360 view of uh, this person, right, or, or this representation of, of a, a community. Um, and that kind of helps um, with uh, the decision making it won't be perfect i think it, i don't think it would never be uh, it will ever be perfect but it's more of like if we have that and then we have like a central repository where we store this information and then continuously building on top of it and then that itself will form its own uh, process of triangulation to kind of get the accuracy uh, that we require in in a much later time it won't be like a directly tomorrow kind of thing yeah uh, thanks, Jeff, Anga, and Iswan for sharing the different ways that we can approach um, looking into inclusivity or user co-designing with those who are uh, disabled. Um, I want to give a shout out to Swarai, Rahma, if you're there, um, go on the chat. Um, they're our partner for anyone who needs um, disability user testing. Um, so she's, uh, she, yeah. She helps us to kind of accessibility check, do it does accessibility check and does user testing as well. So um, yeah, so that's that. Um, before I close, are there any burning questions that you want to ask between panelists? I'm gonna open it up for for y'all. I I feel like I've learned a lot just listening to what all the panelists have to say. Um, this has been really educational for me. Um, I, and I, I'd love to continue learning um, about, the, about how inclusion um, is seen culturally in Southeast Asian, uh, the, the region as a whole, but maybe, I think maybe more 
uh, specifically like the specific countries um, and, and like where do I even go are there general resources that I can access um, that you'd recommend or um, or do I just need to keep talking to folks like you <laughs> you, you just gotta keep talking to folks like us <laughs> we just gotta keep talking I mean that's that's definitely uh, something I would love to do but, yeah uh, but if there are resources that you found useful in your work um, that are lo like local or that reflect um, the Southeast Asian kind of perspective on this. Uh, I'd love to, to hear about your favorite resource. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's more of like, is anyone here going to write a book about it, right? <laughs> um, I, think, I think we lack a lot of uh, Southeast Asian perspective in design in terms of writing. And, and the Western world is so good at writing and, and producing, producing and producing. And for us, we take it in and then we bring to these forums and we discuss great points, but then then it's just there, right? Mm. So I was thinking it's like, hey, is anybody gonna write about it? Mm. Jay is writing a book, that's great. <laughs> you know, oh, we, we definitely need a lot more uh, writers from, from this side of the world, I feel. That's fun. I'd read I'd read some books. I love reading. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean like my talk <laughs> we started off with a report so maybe that's a start to a book <laughs> i don't know <laughs> maybe Aspia, did you want to say something no i say i think we 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 have the technology and the mediums to do it um there's no reason not to start from the report that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And uh, coming back to creating capabilities and central repositories, I think design has to think about on those kind of uh, wavelengths. Um, I know it goes bridging towards the idea of having unicorn designers who design and code at the same time. Um, and also it bridges a lot of different areas of design, like um, designing for education, designing for content information and all this that stuff. Yeah. But I think design needs to like be aware to be more amplify in terms of the things that we want to do bring forward the good we need to be able to do all different things and that's the great thing about design right we have people from different um backgrounds that can trans not transfer can can just transition into this this path so i think we do have the people um but we don't have that um united platform to be able to do that well in a democracy or not in democracy in in, in response to inclusion of everybody being able to write that. We have media, uh, we have medium, we have all those uh, CMS systems that's public. So what's stopping us to create this collective? So yes. Vilia, Gus, Vicky, Jade, and Gabby, good job in, in putting this together, this forum, um, this uh, report, uh, hands off to all of you, clap your hands or whatever, but you guys are doing it. Right, so just want to underline that out to everybody. Cool, thank you so much, Asya, for the shout out. And um, maybe, like, uh, I also want to say something to the audience, though. So, um, I feel that despite like whether you have interest or not for inclusive design, I personally feel that delving into inclusive design as a mindset and really practicing this will definitely make you a better designer. It's a much more complex area of design where you have to consider multiple variables and whatnot. Yep. Um, and if you can design for, you know, like more inclusively, for sure you would be able to design better for your mainstream users as well, because you have like a very good understanding of the different, you know, segments of the users, right? So um, see this not just as if we loop back to uh, the, the initial conversation, right? Like see this not just as a checklist, but as a mindset that you guys need to start to instill, totally. um, um, experiment, uh, try to do little uh, you know, experience and whatnot. Because um, personally, I feel that it will for sure hone you to be a better designer. Yeah. Totally, totally. And of course, thank you for 62 uh, for <laughs> arranging this. Um, it's good that we start to have conversation about this. Uh, and hopefully this won't be the last time. You, you guys are the champion for this, so you just have to. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thank well, you we so just much. Started I'm in. To cry hearing you guys giving us a shout out. <laughs> it's been in here, really. That's that's Billia. That's Billia. 
speaking. But yeah, thank you so much, uh, guys. Um, Jeff, Aspia, Iswan, and Anga for, for today. Um, I mean, this is only us all learning together as well. I'm also learning a lot about Southeast Asia, a lot about inclusion that just be, goes beyond um, disability, also cultural nuances, right? So I think um, you want to keep the conversation going, definitely. So be sure to keep an eye out for events like this. Um, we're also going to be sending out a feedback form for everybody. So if you do, if you are interested, or if you have certain questions about inclusive design, um, shoot it out in that feedback form, and we'll be able to maybe do something about it and make an event out of it. Um, yeah, so thank you guys, um, Jeff, Aspia, Iswan, and Anga for today. Really appreciate your time. I know we are a bit running over time, but that was really good conversation. I really was inspired by a lot of the thinking behind it as well. Thank you so much for creating the space for it. Yeah, yeah. thanks everyone. Thank you for the invite. Thank you everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Um, and before I um, let everybody go, um, I just have like a few announcements and housekeeping. Um, so we do have that virtual photo booth. We're going to be sending it out to everybody at the end of the session. So be sure to keep an eye out. We also have a few. Um, so the, this download souvenir is actually in the chat. Thanks, Gabby, for that. Um, we also have a mailing list. So if you're interested to get updates about what we're doing in Project Lima and as a design community as well, what we're doing in, in inclusion, you can sign us sign up in that mailing list. The link would be in the chat as well. Also, uh, we're gonna be giving out more resources on inclusion. So all the resources mentioned here, we're gonna put it into a resource bank for everybody uh, to share. So if you are in that mailing list, you'll probably be updated with that resource list as well. Um, other than that, follow us on social media. <laughs> um, super quick plug there, but yeah, we are growing our uh, community. We are looking actually into developing into something of a design community for Project Lima. So be sure to follow us on socials so that you get the latest update on when that's happening and when that um, community will roll out. So, so yes, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you again for the guest speakers, panelists, um, for Vilya, Gabby, and Tasha who helped run this uh, event together with me. Um, I hope you have a great weekend uh, and yeah, tune in. <laughs> <laughs>